Welcome back to part two of From Marginal to Mainstream. The feedback has been spectacular for this episode. I knew it would, Helen. I knew people would love the way you think and how very, very appropriate it is for innovation. It's a great pleasure to welcome back the author of that brilliant book, From Marginal to Mainstream, Helen Edwards. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be back. It's great to come back for part two as well. It really is. And we were just on that verge of getting to the positive side of the margins. And there's a part in the book where you say, if you're going for growth, you got to understand why the margins and why now. And I have a great quote that I'm going to use to tee you up and please bring it whichever way you like. You say, if you're going for high growth, don't start with something that's already grown. Don't start, in other words, from the mass because growth from here will tend to be slow and incremental. Start instead from something small, marginal, promising, and see if you can achieve the spectacular. Over to you, Helen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's self-evident, really, isn't it? That if you're going for explosive growth, you're not going to get it if something's already grown. You know, it needs to be small in order to get explosive growth. And I think that's why um, we should look... And I think I said it last last time as well. I'm not I'm not an advocate of drop everything you're doing on innovation and move it all to marginal thinking. What I'm saying is we just haven't embraced marginal thinking in the way that we should recently. And it's a place to look, especially for breakthrough growth. So, you know, do continue to do all that good stuff around, you know, core, extended core adjacent space. But we are all charged with looking for breakthrough growth as well. And this is a place to look. And I think when when I was looking at this myself, I think there are some really big reasons in a sort of why now for that as well. And I think there are a couple of there are a few cultural factors that are pushing in marginal sort of direction. So one is um, social media, of course. And what I mean by that is not influencers, because I think I also said last time, by the, by the time you've got an influencer or a celebrity all over it, it's not marginal anymore. So what I mean by that, where social media can help us is that these behaviours are more visible to us across the globe more easily. And so you see it, whether it's on TikTok or somebody sends you something, uh, a video they've seen on YouTube, it's just more easily accessible and visible to us if we're socially connected and we see those. So, so that's why so, how social media can be your friend in, and why I think it will be the friend of marginal behaviours because it brings more of them to the fore. I think the second reason is, is also a media reason, which is to do with the explosion of TV platforms and streaming. And so what that means is, you know, we've got so much choice about where what we watch, whether it's from Netflix or Apple or Disney or Paramount or traditional TV channels. And all of these TV platforms, including YouTube now, I guess, have to have content. They have to provide content for, that people would want. And so there's been a content explosion. And one of the types of content, which is relatively easy and relatively cheap to make, and people love it, is sort of human interest content. So you'll, you'll see content on these platforms around unusual behaviours. You know, Louis Theroux was kind of famous to it, but he was almost too extreme. But we see other types of content coming to the fore that are kind of about people living unusual lives. And we'll, I, and so that helps as well. And it's, it's simply because that type of content is relatively cheap, quite honestly, to make versus Bridgerton or a massive drama or succession. You know, if you just think about it, that's expensive. Finding an unusual community or unusual ways of living is relatively, is not expensive and you can just go and film it. So I think it's the explosion in streaming. And then the third point, and I'm not a massive fan of generational, you know, let's look at a generation, they're all the same because it's, you know, that can't be true. But Gen Z, I think is very interesting. It's the biggest cohort that we've got at the moment. And I think they are at, at, at risk of generalising, but I'm going to do it anyway. They are generally less tribal, more open um, and more willing to. Well, any younger generation is less is want, wants to try things. But I think this point about being open minded, accepting and less tribal is really key because that's the generation that rather than say, well, I'm in this tribe and that's all they'll do, they'll they'll pick and choose other things. And one of the things that was striking is when we did the research, we did research with different cohorts. And, um, 
you know, the, the, the Gen Xers and even millennials, you know, if you put something in front of them like polyamory or insect protein, you get a very visceral response you, that you can almost see it. They go, oh, oh, no, that's disgusting. Whereas with the Gen Zers, what you kind of got was you could see that their visceral response was probably disgust, but they would stop themselves and they go, well, obviously, I'm very open minded. So anyone who wants to do that. So there's a very it's it's it is a generational like attitude of I'm not going to judge. I'm just not going to judge. And we really saw that, actually. There's a third part in there that you talk about in the structural and cultural changes. And it's one that's very dear to the heart of this show and something that you were even talking to me about off air, which is diversity. And there's a beautiful quote that I just have to share in here that you say, the combination of diversities now beginning to enrich the workplace gives the promotion of marginal behaviors a thrust from the inside, from the corporate world out. The more people differ in their ethnicity, gender, background, age and sexuality, the greater the likelihood that they will have encountered different marginal behaviours and life choices. Combine that with a declared celebration of diversity of thought and you will get people speaking up for those marginal behaviours in corporate decisions, innovation programmes, new product development, new market categories and new routes to growth. This diversity on the inside is one of the reasons we will see more ways to satisfy the extraordinary behavioral diversity that exists, hitherto often unrecognized in contemporary society. I absolutely love that excerpt. And this is something that's very dear to your heart. Completely. Yeah. So I talked about I've talked about three almost like external cultural factors that are a reason why I think marginal behaviors will be more have more propulsion. But this one's an internal one, you know, Business has talked the talk of diversity for a very long time, but I think it now really is becoming real. And what's wonderful, I think, about modern diverse thinking is it goes beyond uh, gender and, and, uh, and ethnicity, I think, are, are like the starting blocks. And now we're seeing diversity of thought, diversity of background. And at the same time, culturally, businesses are much more open to collaboration and hearing people's ideas from across the organisation. So, you know, when I first started working, I probably never shared my thoughts because I was too, I just did what did as I was told from my boss, from my boss. But now that's just, you know, I, I was saying the other day, the barista can kind of question our choices. Anyone can question our choices. And I think there's a lot of good that, that comes from that. So it means that that, comp that internal combination of we will have true diversity within this organization we're not just going to get to employ people who are a bit like us that's brilliant for all the good reasons that diversity is good but it's also brilliant for growth because it brings in people who've had different backgrounds different life experiences and they can bring all of that to an innovation uh, work stream that had never been had before so that's brilliant so you'll have people who have come into the workplace who may have been brought up in a new nomadic way or were homeschooled or, you know, whose parents were vegans. And they bring all of that into, you know, the the platform of marketing, which I think is brilliant. It really is brilliant. And I, I love that whole section of the book as well. There's so much in the book and the research really does shine through. We covered the beacons in part one. But in part two of the book, you go deeper into those beacons and you take them in pairs. And I thought we'd do that today and, and try and pick some of the behaviors that you researched. For example, beacon one and two, you have intensity and resistance. And you use the great case study of homeopathy to bring these to life. Maybe we'll do that for audience. And again, shining a light on these two beacons that we covered in part one, intensity and resistance. Well, homeopathy is, is such an interesting one because I think intensity and resistance I talked about last, last week, you need them both. So you need intensity because if you haven't got a small group of people who really, really believe in the benefits of this behaviour, it's never going to go anywhere. It's just going to fritter and die. And then resistance is self-evident. If there weren't resistance, it, would, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be marginal. It would be mainstream. Now, homeopathy is a really interesting one because it's never really become mainstream. And so when we wrote the book, you know, we wanted to look at behaviours that have made the journey, like veganism, exercise for its own sake, which I talked about last week, 
tattoos even, mindfulness and sleep, they kind of have made the journey, but homeopathy never really has. And part of the reason is, you know, there are intense advocates uh, for homeopathy. They really believe that it can have a clinical benefit. It's been around an incredibly long time. Um, but equally, there are the resistance to homeopathy is sort of practical and emotional. So there are there's also a very strong and powerful scientific body that says homeopathy just doesn't work. And there's ever and they've got scientific evidence for that. And so the resistance in a way, particularly from a very authoritative body, and I think this raises a slightly different issue around resistance, which is if you've got resistance, not just coming from people who are going, oh, I don't really believe in it, or it's a bit weird, isn't it? Or, you know, whatever. If you've also got resistance coming from a powerful unified body, like the medical, the clinical medical community, I think you've got, you know, that is a that is a big wall of resistance that is probably hard to get over. And I think in the end, that's what's held homeopathy back. Combined with the fact, I think homeopathy would be ripe for reframing. Because when I started to look at homeopathy itself in a bit more detail, one of the things that we saw was that the homeopathic consultation, if you like, is very whole person. So it's not all about the diluted version of the thing that's meant to cure you. It's more about let me look at you holistically as a person. But what homeopathy have always done is put homeopathy against traditional clinical pharmacology. Whereas if I were in homeopathy, I would be saying it's adjuvant to traditional therapy. So take your traditional, you know, pharmacological drugs and do homeopathy because our whole person approach means that we have the ability to partner that with the placebo effect, which is so powerful. You know, there's nothing fake about the placebo effect. And homeopathy, I think, could be reframed as a sort of placebo effect releaser, if you like. Now, it's never done that because its argument is all about we work just like that. But you can come at it another way. I wanted to come to that, actually, the misalignment and reframing, because even you talk about, well, the alignment becomes we're both trying to get people well again. We're both trying to get people into optimal health. But then the, I thought it was really interesting. You say not only is it about reframing the practice of homeopathy, but it's actually reframing the word even placebo effect, which actually helps because you can unlock people. Because the thing about placebo, as you say, is people think it's a bit of a kind of, ah, I got you. And when you reframe it, it becomes something totally different. Maybe we'll say something on that. And then I'd love to share the spectrum of resistance which is so interesting because I thought that would be so useful for our corporate audience who meet this resistance and see it as one type of resistance. But when you see it as a spectrum, it gives you a way to unlock it. So maybe we'll come back to that after covering misalignment and reframing, particularly to do with the placebo effect. Yeah, so misalignment and reframing, I, I guess it's to continue that, that point about homeopathy, which is that misalignment is when the reason to resist it um, is the reason it, it sort of hits the reason to do it and you can sort of come around it so even in veganism it was a bit like the reason to do it from the early vegans was because of animal welfare but the reason not to be a vegan was because they believed they needed animal products and you can sort of come around it the other way and say it's not so much about animal welfare it's just that plants are better for you oh well okay so it's almost like you avoid the central argument and it feels like and that's misalignment and for homeopathy that's a similar thing is that the two parties the sort of pharmaceutical clinical research traditional medicine group have come head on with the homeopathy group who have gone it's all about we can cure you whereas actually there's you can come around that and say you know homeopathy does something slightly different you know Traditional clinical, you know, drugs are about are about a chemical effect in the body and you've got all of your research that you do. But we're doing something else and it make, and it affects the, the, the mind as much as the body because of how homeopathy works. And the placebo effect is just so powerful. You know, you're right, Aidan, usually because in clinical trials, there's a kind of, am I taking a placebo or not? And it, I think that's what's done for it, actually, is that it's seen as the thing that won't work because you're in a clinical trial. Whereas the placebo effect is, is, is on its own incredibly, incredibly powerful. So I mentioned this resistance 
and in particular the spectrum of resistance and i thought beyond this being useful for a marketer and understanding marginal behaviors it's so so useful understanding resistance in any phase as an entrepreneur as a startup or even as a corporate entrepreneur trying to bring a new idea to life i'm going to share on the screen now figure 4.4 from the book which is this spectrum of resistance you have with behavior placement maybe you'll take us through that helen at a high level one of the things we found is resistance isn't all the same and it was well worth you understanding the nature of your resistance. And so what we found, which you're seeing on the screen, is that there's a spectrum of resistance from resisting something because you literally feel it's life-threatening or dangerous to you, all the way through various shades of weirdness, like it's just, it's disgusting, or it's weird. It's, you do it, but it's a bit weird, that's fine. Or I'm resisting. I can see that that's a very nice thing to do, but it's just a bit idealistic, you know, not really for me. Through to, do you know what? I'm kind of interested in that, but I, I wouldn't know where to start. And so understanding why people resist is gives you something to work with for two, two reasons, really. One is if your resistance that you're encountering is more towards practical resist, I'm interested, but I wouldn't know how to do it then an innovation team has the power to do something about that. You can help make it more accessible to people who are interested in it. So that's kind of understanding your resistance, kind of reason number one. And the second reason to understand resistance is resistance isn't static. Depending on what's happening in the external environment, resistance may shift and change over time. So one of the behaviours we looked at was free birthing. So that's giving birth in a, as natural environment as possible with the minimum of medical intervention. Now, COVID, that has sh that shifted because of COVID, because people, you know, there, there were that was seen for many people as a reason to resist. It. It's just dangerous. It's you know you shouldn't do that. Whereas because of COVID, sadly, hospitals became a dangerous place to be. They're, in, they're full of infection. You can catch something that could be life-threatening in hospital. So that shifted the resistance to free birthing to something more towards idealistic but impractical. And so it's like, well, OK, I don't want to go the whole hog and give birth in a river with no one around. But is there a way that I could give birth that is more at one with the environment, more natural, less medical. Now we know about home births, but maybe building on that to make it for a more kind of natural experience is a space that there's more openness to, that there wouldn't have been pre-COVID. So resistance can shift, basically. So let's use that as a, a nice segue for the next two behaviours. Again, what, what Helen does later on the book is go deeper into the beacons. And two of the beacons next are accelerators, which like COVID was for free birthing but also vectors. And Helen takes these in, in couples like this in, in pairs. And I thought one of the really interesting ones, so vectors as a transference from one subgroup or marginal group to another, and then accelerator as a way to get it accelerated into the mainstream. One of the really interesting ones, and you mentioned this in part one, was tattoos and how tattoos came be increasingly towards the mainstream. And again, and people might not know this, how it's still resisted in places like Japan. Yeah, exactly. So tattoos sort of fascinated me, uh, actually, for a long time, because I'll make a confession. I, will, I am an early adopter of tattoos. So I had a tattoo in the early 90s uh, in the docks. You couldn't get tattoos. It was down in the docks. Yeah. <laughs> where, you, where are you in prison? <laughs> Uh, I don't even, I don't even know really why I did it and my mother still doesn't know. So uh but anyway, so tattoos have always has always sort of slightly fascinated me because tattoos have a really interesting story because they are associated with prison subcultures. So very sort of um subversive subcultures because weirdly enough um, there's so much you can't do in prison. And so prisoners would try to find things that they could, ways they could be illegal, if you like. And, and giving themselves tattoos, often using guitar strings, was a way that they could be dangerous and subversive and different and break the rules. And, and so tattoos are part of prison culture. And obviously, as we know, they've also been part of um, sort of services, you know, sailors and uh, that kind of culture the the other thing that comes out of prison culture which we put in the book is low riding you know when uh trousers are sort of falling down people's bums that that is part comes out of prison culture 
because they couldn't, they weren't allowed belts. <laughs> so, and and then obviously middle class kids see that and pick it up. I and mean, it's kind of cool to be a bit subversive. And that's how, so it's like a subculture as a vector, bringing some of these marginal behaviours, low riding, which is not a marginal behaviour, it's more of a trend, but actually tattoos into the mainstream because they get carried by the subculture. And I think I mentioned last week in veganism, a similar thing happened because being a punk and also being a hippie, part of being in that subculture was that you were also a vegan. And so it sort of brings... You know, the punk kid comes into their mainstream household and says, oh, I'm not going to eat meat anymore. And it's like, oh, why are you doing it? It's part of, I'm, I'm punk now. But also it brings it in. So, so, so looking for subcultures, bigger subcultures, which are often, they're not marginal behaviours. Subcultures like sweep together lots of different behaviours and, and you become a group that does them, can sometimes bring a specific behaviour of the subculture a specific behaviour in subculture has appeal to the mainstream, if you see what I mean. So, you know, a subculture of ex-prisoners, for example, there's lots about that that you wouldn't probably wouldn't want in the mainstream. But tattoos, that kind of can be extracted and is appeal, appealing to the mainstream and similar to sort of veganism. And then accelerators is a really interesting one that, again, I think we often forget, to, just forget to do, which is when you're looking at an innovation programme, and, and even when you're looking at branding, which I do, is to go, OK, what's happening outside of all of this that could have an impact on what we're trying to do? And you can usually break it down into sort of social, political, legislation, wider culture, you know, technology, health. You, and I think in the book, we put a table of, of the accelerator areas to look at. And it's just a piece of, you know, just be thorough with it. And it's like, okay, are we looking, you know, microdosing, lots of legislation change happening at the moment. We're probably going to see more. Look out for that accelerator. COVID was an accelerator for a number of behaviours um, and other kind of social or environment. And obviously, you know, the whole global warming is an accelerator for, for various um, behaviours as well. So, looking to that wider environment around technology, politics, social and culture, you know, medical, uh, science, uh, and, and the, the whole table is there. And just mentally and get someone to do the research, go through what's going on here that could make a difference to us, actually. And one of the things I thought just out of interest to mention was that you talked about, say, for example, the behavior of life logging, something that I do not as uh, as a devotee, like the people you mentioned in the book, but the the really interesting thing was some global event like the pandemic can be an accelerator to do things that you've always wanted to do anyway. And it's just like, going, well, now is the right time or now it's acceptable, you know, even to, to the point about regulation. I thought that was an interesting point to bring up. Yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, that life logging quantified self is such an, such an interesting marginal behaviour. And I think so much opportunity there as well. Because, yeah, COVID has given it a push. Because I, th I think for a couple of reasons. One is people are so much more aware of their... Because we had to be in COVID. Everyone was sort of symptom aware. And, you know, and because we didn't really know how COVID was spread, you then become aware of other people and your proximity to them and how things get spread. So we've suddenly become much more aware of that. But at the same time, I think, particularly in Western cultures, we've all got kind of hit between the eyes about just how un under pressure our health systems are. And, you know, maybe it's in a rarefied way, I would say, probably wealthier, more middle class. There is definitely a move to say, well, I'm going to look after myself, actually. And I want to optimise myself rather than be so dependent on somebody, a body fixing me that isn't doesn't have the resource to do it and so yeah I think Covid definitely gave that whole quantified self life logging a shove and then you get brilliant innovators in the space like the Zoe app you know where they take a space like uh you know blood sugar microbiome and they they really double down on that area which I think so I think what we're seeing is the quantified self being sort of fragmented so it's kind of like the Zoe app doing the stomach bit whoop is a company that make wristbands that focus very much on heart and sleep. Then you've got Calm in the area of sort of, 
you know, uh, mental health wellness. So it's sort of a quantified self is almost being fragmented down, actually, which is very clever. And this lovely segue again to the next two be- behavior or the next two beacons, beacon six, which is reversal and beacon eight dilution are pretty significant when it came to the great case study. And I was dying to get to this one. You again l- alluded to it in part one about the gentleman being arrested for jogging <laughs> for our, and what you talk about here is the evolution of exercise for its own sake, but particularly through reversal and dilution, it becomes really, really interesting to look at. Yeah, so yeah, exercise for its own sake, which I think we did talk a little bit about last time, which is um, the notion that really, you know, in the late 60s, nobody did any exercise for its own sake. There was no need to. Uh, We got all the physical exercise we needed from just being alive, you know, from having to do work, which was primarily manual, and then having to look after ourselves, which was also primarily manual. We walked up steps. We didn't get in lifts or escalators. We hand washed our clothes, you know. So, so, But that a massive change happened in the late 50s and early 60s where we were more sedentary. And that's that is the notion of reversal. And it happened in veganism as well, which is, you know, and when reversal happens, so literally the whole thing turns around something, it, the, the behaviours around it explode very quickly. So there was no reason for people to exercise for its own sake, go jogging, go to the gym, because actually... By the time you just lived your life, you needed to rest, not do more. Then the opposite happened. Living life became so sedentary that you needed to exercise for its own state to be alive. So it's a complete reversal. And that's when you get and it won't happen very often, but you've really got to look for it when it does. When that happens, it's like a runaway train. It just sort of takes off. And that's really what we saw with exercise for its own sake. It wasn't just... Uh, it just took off and it's the exercise revolution and, you know, started with kind of jogging and bodybuilding. And, and it's still we see that uh, feeding so many categories for the last 20 or 30 years, actually explosive growth of the exercise revolution. So that's the notion of reversal. It's like suddenly the whole thing flips in the opposite direction. And then dilution is when innovate. This is where innovators have a part to play again, which is finding ways to give people the chance to do this a little bit. Uh, You know, so Aidan, you even talked about it. You said, well, I like life logging, but not in a full on sort of a way. And that's exactly what um, innovators have the opportunity to give people. So if you're at that impractical end of the spectrum, very often it's also people going, I don't want to do full on homeopathy. I don't want to be a full on polyphasic sleeper or quantified self but I'd like a little bit of it. And then innovators and businesses can give mainstream people a little bit of it. So if you take something like polyphasic sleeping, which is sleeping according to your own body clock, rather than like you've got to knock yourself out for eight hours at night. And then, you know, and and again, COVID has given that a shove because people can often work from home. And so they recognize, actually, I get a real downtime at four o'clock. But then you can give people a little bit of that by perhaps giving them an app which helps them wind down and wind back up again along with a tea. Do you see what I mean? So you can help people do a little bit of something. And that's where innovators and clever marketers have got a real role to play. And I think these kind of bits of the quantified self like Calm or the Zoe app or Whoop, that's exactly what they're doing. They're diluting the quantified self from this full on all biometrics, all psychometrics every day to all have a little bit of it. And so by the time you've got to dilution, you're really beginning to, it's beginning to become mainstream, actually. And that's almost like the final bit. It's like reframing dilution kind of thing. And we'll cover that because I loved how you talked about Oatly, the brand, the oat milk brand, how they dealt with dilution, particularly in the States by working with baristas. We'll come back to that one, though, because I wanted to talk a little bit more about dilution particularly because I recognize like you did, it's so valuable for innovators or startups or entrepreneurs, or even somebody trying to bring a new idea or business model from within a legacy organization, trying to find pockets that are willing to give it a try. And you talk about dilution being broken into three constituent phases. One is the dilution of resistance, the second of intensity, and the third of difficulty itself. And I just want to remind our audience that dilution of difficulty is making it easier for people. 
that's exactly what happens with any type of disruptive innovation. It always starts off, doesn't work very well, breaks down a lot, just like the car when it got into mainstream, when it started first being appearing in the world in the late 1800s, didn't work. And people, you have to be really highly skilled to drive a car because it was difficult. And taking away this difficulty becomes really interesting. But these three phases are really key to understand. I'd love you to share them, Helen. Yeah, so we we looked at di the dilution. You're right, there's, you begin to see a dilution of the resistance. And, and that might be because of an accelerator. So people suddenly begin to go, well, hang on a minute. You know, this could be something that a bit like I've talked about with free birthing or quantified self, that's a dilution of the resistance. Now, at the same time, those in, those intense advocates, you need some of them. And almost always, it's such an interesting thing, intensity, because there's a, there's a sort of a, a push and a pull happening. Because very often, the intense advocates of a behaviour want it to be theirs. But at the same time, they believe in its benefits for humanity. And so they sort of want humanity to do it. Do you see what I mean? So there's, there's a sort of a push and a pull going on, because as soon as everybody else does it, it's kind of not theirs anymore, which is why we get that language around a dirty vegan, I think. So it allows the intense advocates to still have a sense of otherness. And I think one of the skills, actually, if you're an innovator who's working with a, a group of intense advocates, say like people who really believe in homeopathy, is to respect that intensity and not trample all over it. Because if you respect their intensity, they're more likely to help you. So it's almost like, look, listen, we understand that you're the real deal, but we, like you, can see the benefits of this to the wider population. So we're going to try and give people an easier way to do it. So that's how you might dilute the intensity while retaining the support of it. Because what you don't want are the intense advocates fighting you, really. Um, you know, and that's what happened when Sephora tried to bring a witch's, witch's starter kit uh, from Wicca. And the intense Wicca followers said, this is just trivialising something that we really believe in. And they took it off shelf. So intensity of resistance, in, uh, sorry, um, dilution of resistance, dilution of intensity. And then, you know, dilution of practicality. That's where the genius of, as you say, disruptive innovation comes in. How can we give people a way of doing this a little bit? Now, it might be through a technological breakthrough, like we're seeing in some of these quantified self examples. It might be like I was looking at Wicker over the weekend and in home decor at the moment, there's quite a big shift towards wanting to have kind of crystals at home because of they look beautiful, but also there's a story behind them and there's a spirituality to them and there's supposed to be benefits to them like rose quartz or whatever. Now that's in a sense diluting Wicker to bring it into sort of the mainstream. So it's where people are kind of clever and imaginative about what you can do. Um, and Oatly is a very specific example of what, it wasn't really a technological breakthrough. What they did was just something brilliant with baristas, uh, which I should, shall I talk about that now? Yeah, let's, because I wanted to, there's two case studies we said in part one, and I have to come back to it because a few people emailed me and it goes, don't forget to ask Helen about living off the sea. We said we'd come back to kelp. You mentioned kelp in part one. So we need to come back to that. But Oatly is a great case. And I, the reason I wanted to share Oatly was it brings all the beacons to life and it shows the value of persistence. But also, it also shows for people who are entrepreneurs, it wasn't the original entrepreneurial team that actually made this succeed. It was a managerial team. And it was just really clever marketing, really clever people. And if they had the value of knowing the beacons, which you you retrofit the beacons to it, it works perfectly. So I think using your book, having resilience, having grit, being able to pivot, go with the way the market moves for you, the book becomes really valuable playbook to help you with innovation. Yeah, exactly. And I think that looking at it through the lens of Oatly is a, is a good way of looking at a more mainstream company who's kind of done it. Because I think but at the back end of the book, I look at two examples. One is a mental health startup called Spill, who work in the B2B space. And they've done a really interesting thing where what they've done is they, they decided that, you know, they felt that mental health support shouldn't be so rarefied and should be more accessible to everybody. And they found a way to bring that to people using technology. So they find a way to dilute it, if you like. They also reframed it, actually. So if you think about even the name Spill, 
uh, is much more accessible. I'm not, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a, you know, I haven't got mental health issues. I'm just a regular person who's got problems. It, it was they, they just made it so much easier to be part of. And then Oatly, I think, kind of all the way through, you know, reframing, you know, plant based to something again much more acceptable. It's milk, but it's made for humans. I think just that brilliant. And then they also did a very interesting thing, which was to generate trial. They started in the US, but with baristas. So it was kind of like, you know, target baristas who will recommend it because it tastes great in coffee. People were really worried about the taste. And if you're buying like a $5 pack of it, that's quite a big risk that you think, well, I might hate the taste of it, in which case I'm going to chuck the whole lot away and I can't really afford to do that. But it's for barista is saying, we'll try it in coffee, which is what they incentivize. And, and actually, oat milk does tell taste best in coffee. Then that's a low risk way to try it. And you've got the authoritative kind of like, uh, you know, halo effect of somebody who knows what they're talking about, suggesting you try it. So a brilliant, low risk, diluted way to try something that carries risk. It's like, why would I buy a whole cart and I might not like it? So only worked really well for lots of reasons, but I think particularly around that dilution one, which is the one you picked up on. And one of the one, one of the men, uh, elements of Oatly you mentioned was, for example, they when they got that visceral response for people kind of going, yuck, they actually put it on the packaging and made it into a virtue. Yeah, they kind of walked into it. I mean, I think that's very Oatly as well. I mean, I think they created a brand that's very honest, very playful, very on food, actually. And I think, you know, Oatly tells us quite a lot about how to create a differentiated brand as much as it does about how to innovate effectively you know and I think you know I've worked in food quite a lot and if you were to say to a traditional food company our pack's not going to have any sort of lovely green food values about it it's just going to be kind of cartoony they, they would reject it they'd say no 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 we need the food enjoyment shop and the naturalness and but they went against all of those rules and they went all of those rules in that they embraced the resistance they didn't deny it. So it's people said saying it tastes like shit. They said, okay, we'll put it on the put it on the pack, but because not everybody thinks it tastes like shit. So a very clever, you know, branding and marketing disruption, as much as, you know, you know, that alongside with having a plant-based milk that really tasted good, frankly, bringing that into the market. Because, you know, plant-based milks weren't, especially in the US, were pretty big. I mean, rice milk had been around a while, soya milk as well. For those people, three people, you know who you are, who emailed us to say, don't forget to come back to living off the sea. And in particular, what Helen mentioned in part one was kelp. So I'd love to come back to that, Helen, and maybe we'll use the beacons again to wrap around this case study. Yeah, I mean, what kelp was number one on our scale. So I think I mentioned in the last session, we had a scale of uh, behaviours. We just looked at 20 behaviours that we put through a statistical sale to see which ones have most potential to go mainstream. Because it's because if you're an innovator and you were to say to me, well, where do I even start? I'd say start in the top five of the scale. Can you see a relevance to your category? Now, number one of the scale was living off the sea. And what that is, is not eating more fish. That's using kelp as a resource. Now, the reason it was number one is it, people don't resist it, really. Why would you resist it? It's sort of, it doesn't have any of the yuck factor of um, insect protein. Because you can eat it as well. So it's a, it's a protein, it's a natural resource. It doesn't have any of the yuck factor at all for people. The other thing that was really interesting that we saw more qualitatively is people believe that we've used our seas, our oceans as a great big dustbin. And if we respected them more by understanding the biodiversity that can be a resource to us, instead of just chucking our stuff in there, then we might respect our oceans more. So there was a kind of a hang on, this could be a win win, actually. Um, and so... And it's multi-category. What excites me about kelp is you can use it as an ingredient in food, in beauty products, in health products. You can use it as an as a ingredient in packaging. There's a really interesting packaging company called Nopla who make packaging out of kelp that is very biodegradable. You can, in fact, eat it, but it biodegrades. Um, and it's really a no harm crop to grow. So a kelp farm, I think, has just been licensed off Wales, I think a couple of weeks ago. And 
it's the kelp, natural ocean kelp grows at two feet a day. So, you know, that's why, you know, it's a lot. Naturally, at two feet a day, exactly. And it's a no harm crop to farm. You know, you, we won't be damaging our seas biodiversity. Uh, it grows very quickly, very naturally, and it's an incredibly useful resource to us. And I think if you combine that with actually that's us respecting our oceans and what they can do for us rather than us going, well, there's something, there's another place we can dump our, our rubbish in. We shouldn't dump our rubbish in it because we, we want that, the, we want what the ocean can give us in the form of, say, kelp. Then I think you've got something really very kind of special and sort of magical that you can bring to multiple categories. So if I were in food and drink, beauty, health, clothing, packaging, uh, I would be looking. I would be looking at this. I'd be all over this right now, saying, "How could I use kelp uh, to help me, you know, innovate and grow and connect with people?" I love that. And actually, there's a couple of um, couple of our audience, Lorna and Bill, in particular, you guys who work in packaging, and this will be so so valuable for them. So I'm going to make sure they they come across it as well. Speaking of members of the audience, we have so many marketers who listen to the show, and the last quote and the last section this last question really for you helen is for them because it can be so frustrating if you're a marketer and sometimes an accidental marketer you've fallen into the role and you're entrepreneurial underneath and there's a quote here that will just great for so many of them but i'd love you to expand on it you say mainstream marketers may find themselves working in businesses that are not especially entrepreneurial so how does this balance of risk and reward work in that scenario? How does a corporately trained marketer break old habits and embrace new ones? How do you even begin to convince the multidisciplinary, hierarchical management structures that characterize the corporate world that the whole idea of venturing to the margins is worthwhile? A lot in there, Helen, but at a high level, because the last ch chapter nine of the book is dedicated to that question, those questions. But at a high level, you're stuck in a lift with these people. What would you say? I think I would say I'm not asking for all of our innovation budget. I'm asking for 10 percent of it less. And I'm asking for give me the license to look at this potential in a small way. Uh, and I'll keep the risks as low as I can. Because I think in the end, you know, the next two to three years growth is great, but we all need to be thinking three years and beyond. That's how we're going to be really successful as a company, you know, and as human beings, especially in the sustainability space. And so I think as a marketer in a highly traditional business, I would be saying, listen, it's not about flipping everything over here, but just give me a bit. Just give me a bit. Let me run some experiments. I'm not going to bet, bet the house on it. I'm going to do this in a very methodical way. We're going to look at some low-key experiments that could just move us forward a bit. Uh, that's what I would do. I wouldn't ask for the. I wouldn't ask for a lot, but I'd ask for a bit. And there's a thing that actually came to mind. I said it to um, a, a corporate person I was talking to today. Is that oftentimes, as as an innovator within an organisation, you're 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 dealing with their marketing team and all of a sudden the marketing team in your mind become the enemy. And one of the reasons that happens is, and I'm sure you've seen this before is say, for example, it was me, <laughs> not, not, I'm going to change the names to protect the innocent here, but this guy Hayden was working in this organization and had, had some ideas, tried to bring them to life. And then the CEO goes, Oh yeah, work with marketing over here. And then marketing, I, I'm great. Marketing are great. They're always coming up with new ideas. But then I'm trying to build from this idea that I can clearly see in my head forward. And they want to go then and ask the audience what they want, or the, the they want to ask the customer. And just understanding the way you you framed that in the book is because that's the way they've been trained is to ask what the customer wants. If it's negative, oh, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> and maybe then try and pivot around it in order to get the, the answer you want versus the innovator or the corporate entrepreneur in, in residence is trying to think about this brand new thing that doesn't exist, that, that they have just this sensation that will work. And they come at loggerheads then. And th this is a worldwide phenomenon that happens everywhere. And you have some suggestions to get around that as well. 
end, it's about, I mean, there's no, I think we've, I think with marketers, marketers understand that they have to put the consumer at the heart. I think where you can agree is that we've got to put the consumer at the heart of everything we do, whether it's innovation or marketing. We can, that's, that's the point of agreement. It's kind of how you do that. And I think the point about traditional marketing, when you're going, you know, when you've got a new comms campaign or you're thinking about doing something in retail media, is it is you do need to validate that with your consumers so you go out and say look we're thinking of communicating in this way does that work for you yes no don't use that language great but in the case of innovation the only way to successful the innovate is to get ahead of that consumer to anticipate what they might want next and i think it's getting marketers to see that division to go yes the approach of asking customers what they want is absolutely right for certain areas of marketing But for other areas of marketing, we still put the customer at the heart of what what we want and what we're doing, but we do it in a different way because they don't know what they don't know and they don't know how they may feel in the future. So we have to work differently with consumer research. I'm not saying don't do any consumer research. I'm saying maybe do some other sort of consumer research like ethnography, for example, which allows us to understand how people are living rather than asking them what they want. So I think... For me, with marketers, it's about finding the connection point we can all agree on and then going, so you see, in this way, validation is right. But in this place, validation isn't right. And they'll often go, oh, I've got you. So rather than kind of coming like that, it's more about we agree on this. Now let's see why why you need, we need to do this differently. If you can, if you can have that conversation for long enough. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly but then that becomes mi- misalignment become an alignment it becomes reframing all the stuff that you talk about in the book helen it's been an absolute pleasure i've learned so much from the book and from our conversations for people and brands who want to reach out to you maybe want to work with you and passion brand or want to find out more about your book and your work and your writings where is the best place to find you Best place is definitely LinkedIn. Um, I mean, you, you can contact me via Passion Brand. It's up there. It's a website that's easy to find. But LinkedIn is probably the easiest place to make contact. I'm pretty active on it. I'll always respond. So, yeah, please do. And again, I want to remind our audience, I have three copies up for grabs of this brilliant book from Marginal to Mainstream. And I want to thank the author of that fantastic book, Helen Edwards. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Aidan.